the, um, there were millimeter wave observations prior to this uh, at ARO, as John reminded us uh, earlier today. So uh, it wasn't, uh, although lo much longer, about nine millimeter wavelengths, wavelength, but um, this was the beginning of millimeter, millimeter wave spectroscopy. In 1968, a proposal was submitted to NRC from UBC for a negotiated development grant. <clears throat> it was submitted by uh, Bill Shooter for a radio astronomy project, Michael Lovenden, optical astronomy, and Roy Nodwell for laboratory astrophysics. Bill Shooter was relatively new at UBC, having been there about uh, two to three years by this time. In 1970, 538,600 was awarded to the three projects, and not coincidentally, but uh, very uh, appropriate time, 1970, the J equals one to zero CO line was detected by Penzias and Wilson. <clears throat> Bill Shooter had this uh, idea in mind to build a telescope to operate at millimeter wavelength, wavelengths, and um, to develop the expertise uh, at a receiver and the expertise needed to run this observatory, and then eventually to transfer the uh, equipment and any expertise we had gained to the Algonquin Radio Observatory because uh, the, up, the surface was be, had been planned to be upgraded. Uh, you wouldn't think you'd be, or Vancouver was the ideal place to put a millimeter wave telescope, especially operating at one to zero CO, but it's uh, in the summer times not that bad. The, uh, there are better places. But um, the, um, it's usable for one to zero observations. Um, and the uh, water vapor content of the atmosphere is uh, reasonably high, but uh, still, as I say, usable. The, uh, sorry, the, some of the funds were used to hire Gisbert Winnewisser and, and me at the time as a PDF, and uh, an engineer, Chris Chan, who stayed with us for quite a few years and was very, very useful, instrumental for our, any success we had. Um, after one year, Gisbert left for a faculty position in Germany. And in 1973, uh, Phil, sorry, Phil, it's a typo on my part. Uh, Phil Gregory and I were hired by the Department of Physics to faculty positions. So the uh, antenna was ordered from Andrew Antenna Company in Ontario. And this uh, shows the construction in 1974, almost fully constructed, and the control room in summer 1975. The big fins there at the back were a counterweight. You can see it was polar mounted. Um, we didn't have the sophistication to drive an alt azimuth, and uh, it was polar mounted, and that uh, it was a counterweight and also a windbreak for, uh, for the antenna. The um, Receiver technology at that time was, of course, uh, the first uh, element in the receiver was a mixer, and uh, uh, Shockey barrier diode mixers were used, and this uh, was one, the first one we developed was at room temperature. Um, the source we had at Bell Labs, uh, were, uh, only a few people in the world, I think, were really making good mixers at the time, good diodes anyway, and good mixers. And um, Bell Labs, uh, was uh, some of the people were at Bell Labs, and they passed on their, their sort of second-class diodes to us. And uh, we worked with those to try and make a decent receiver at UBC. And the, this was at room temperature. And uh, you can see the, uh, this uh, pin here as a whisker uh, wire attached to the end of it. And the diodes are at the end of this, uh, this pin over there. And there were many, many mounted on that pin. And using a stereo microscope, you could see as you pushed in this pin here, uh, if you're making contact and then uh, detecting the IV curve. Sorry. Oh. Detecting the IV curve, you could tell what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of um, um, diode it was to see whether it was. Uh, you wanted a very, very sharp uh, uh, turnover, a uh, nonlinear diode. So, you wanted, uh, and some, some of them were very, very shallow, so they weren't any good at all, but some of them were reasonably sharp, and we were able to uh, use uh, this technology to get our first uh, results from the telescope. Um, this is a scan of the sun 
and the moon at first quarter, uh, obvious sources to go to see if your receiver is working. And this is uh, HCN 1 to 0 at uh, 88 gigahertz. But it was still, uh, it wasn't a useful receiver. The noise temperature was too high. Um, it, was, um, it wasn't uh, really useful for 1 to 0 CO at this point. I remember uh, Fred uh, Vineldick and I spent some late nights at the telescope trying to uh, understand where, what the contributions to the noise system were. Anyway, lots of difficulties this period. There were uh, shorted klystrons. That was another sort of um, uh, problem, uh, not problem, but uh, challenge to use in the telescope. These klystrons were operated at 300 volts. And um, we shorted some of them. They were gone. Blown diodes, high receiver noise temperatures, and the research grants barely able or unable to support the telescope operations. So in 1976 or 77 thereabouts, uh, we secured a grant for, uh, to buy a commercially available receiver from a firm in Colorado, which covered the 1 to 0 CO line. And this was uh, also a Shockey Barrio diode mixer, cooled with liquid nitrogen and then a closed cycle helium refrigerator. It's better than we had before. Certainly not the world's best, but uh, it was good enough. And our first good CO line, 1 to 0, was detected in May 77. Uh, just days before the CASCA meeting at University of Western Ontario, now, <coughs> now Western University. Um, so that was uh, important for us. And subsequently, uh, this project, which uh, <coughs> was uh, taken on in conversations with uh, Butler Burton to map uh, an area at, uh, around the, uh, in the galaxy, galactic plane at L equals 30 and B equals 0. And from this, we discovered several molecular clouds, clouds and the sizes of them. And uh, that was the first time this area had been surveyed. Well, in the meantime, while operations were slow at UBC, um, other telescopes were used. I must say the Americans were always very generous with their facilities for outsiders. <coughs> and we used the Aerospace 4.6 meter telescope in Los Angeles, uh, the NRAO used to be the 36 foot, and of course evolved to the 12 meter, and then eventually evolved to the uh, Arizona Radio Observatory Telescope before it finally uh, retired. So we used that telescope uh, quite a bit, very good telescope, and also the um, University of Texas Millimeter Wave Observatory. From the mid-1970s to approximately the mid-80s, a decade or so, a bit longer than a decade, it was quite an uncertain time, as many of you remember. Um, plans were being developed to resurface the ARO telescope. So they were continuing, as you heard earlier from uh, John McLeod. And the inner, forgotten, was it 10 to 15 meters of uh, um, section of the telescope capable of operating at millimeter wavelengths and, and the CO wavelength. UBC telescope was uh, struggling because of insufficient funding. The, uh, there was also, to add to the mix, uh, a report by Bill Shooter in 1978 for a Canadian 25 <coughs> meter millimeter wave telescope. Uh, the JCMT was nearing completion, although it was, it was, uh, there were two uh, countries involved then, the United Kingdom and uh, the Netherlands. But it was struggling because of in insufficient funding. And HIA was experiencing budget cuts, as you heard. Finally, in October 1986, plans to refurbish the ARO 46-meter telescope were canceled. And in May 1987, ARO was announced, it was announced that it was going to be closed. And Canada was to join the British and the Dutch in the JCMT. So uh, for the uh, molecular line observers, uh, the die had been cast. UBC was probably one of the last universities to operate as an observatory, uh, to operate an observatory. Uh, the competitors, competitors that I've been mentioning were just much better funded. And now, of course, the trend, <coughs> trend is to um, multi, um, uh, mul well, national, if not multinational facilities. And so the era of the JCMT began. Uh, Canada was a partner from 87 to 2015. It was a common user facility. 
and responsible for getting many Canadian astronomers involved in millimeter and submillimeter meter wavelength observations. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, uh, you're going to hear a lot more about that from uh, Helen in the next talk. Anyway, um, just like to say that um, if you go to, you heard a lot earlier about Queens and radio astronomy at Queens, and uh, if you go to Westbrook, you can still see the field there and remnants of some of the facilities. If you go to UBC now, where the millimeter wave telescope was, there are condos. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions for Bill? Uh, all right. Well, let's thank Bill again. Thanks, Bill.